Mrs. Toy Newkirk, Mr. Danny Hassel, Ms. Joanne Willett, come on guys, more energy, and last but not least, Mr. Robert Englund. Robert for you guys. Round of applause for the audience. Yeah. So all those good looking people came, came just to see you guys and to ask you some questions and to talk to you. So first of all, welcome again to the Weekend of Hell. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And, um, Danke. Danke. And of course, we are here on the stage because um, some Disney movie about princesses? No, just joking. Of course we're here because of the Elm Street Nightmare. And uh, I guess it's a pretty cool thing that you guys are here uh, with us. And a little question to the audience. Guys, if you make photos, just turn off the flashes because it's very distracting for me. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> and... Um, all right, first round of questions, guys. Did you have a chance to go around the uh, comic, uh, sorry, around the venue, about the uh, around the weekend of hell, and to check the merchandise, uh, to check what we have in store, and you know all the really cool things that you can get here. And I'm just having a cool. I saw Rucker Hour. Oh, that's cool. On a like on a scooter. That guy, that guy's just scooting around all over the place. Yeah, he has an That was pretty scooter. neat. Yeah. Electric scooter. I mean, where else are you going to see that? Nowhere. Just on Weekend of Hell. Yeah. Or maybe in Santa Monica. I scored great uh, vintage European posters uh, of myself. I found one uh, from a, a film I had done about the Marquis de Sade and a film I did in Russia where I killed ballerinas. What? And the poster is just bloody ballet shoes hanging nice. on the side. Yeah, the, I, I, and I'm always telling my, my uh, co-stars here, uh, when you come to Europe, look very carefully when they bring you things to sign, because you'll always see images from the publicity department in America that were never used back in the States. But in the, Euro the European uh, publicity departments chose different things to see, and uh, or, or they just had a different take on it. It's the same with Asia. Uh, in Japan, they use images you've never seen anywhere else. But you kind of remember in the back of your head, like they'll they'll take Toy and I aside and shoot photos in the middle of us doing a scene. Uh, you know the, the you know want to suck mouth scene, or they would take. Uh, you know, they would take us aside when we were shooting the scene at the beach Tuesday, and they would shoot stills. But I, I kind of forget until you see them again. And then there's some really, really hot cheesecake photo of Tuesday on the beach. <laughs> Tuesday, have you seen anything cool on the uh, weekend of hell? Did you have a chance to go around to check the merch? You know, I haven't really gone around yet. Oh, really? I'm going to though. Yeah, 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 do yeah definitely. There is a lot of really cool things. A lot of Elm Street uh, nightmares. <laughs> yes. Uh, so pretty cool. And as well, look at our crew uh, shirts. Do you recognize that? Right. They're very I love, cool. I love the, uh, the, the Sunday ones. Those are great, you guys. They're all yeah. personalized. It's really, it's kind of Yeah, unique. yeah, they have names on there. Yeah, on the they're back. cool. Um, I agree with Robert. I got to see. Uh, I got to sign actually uh, photos that I've never seen of the, my motorcycle, my death scene. And so I've got to sign a few posters that, like you said, they aren't in the states. I've never even seen them. And I'm in a motorcycle suit. And it's really cool. And, oh yeah. Any any of the posters that are in German or French or any other language are super neat. So I'm just a great con, you guys. I love the way it's done. A lot of cool stuff over there. Oh, thank you guys. You know, it's interesting. I was walking by, and I love hats. 
I just love wearing hats and scarves. And there's a lady around the corner that's amazing. making these amazing knitted caps. Oh, yeah. And I was just kind of, I'm going to go buy one. But I haven't had a chance to walk around. But like Robert and Danny were just saying, someone just brought me a photo of, I'm used to seeing either my death, which is the doll being sucked up, or pre- you know, being sucked face, but I just saw someone one where I'm, I'm in latex, and it's really me about to turn into the doll, and I have never really seen a photo of that, but you were just explaining that to me the other night, yeah, and someone just brought it up to the table, and I'm just like, so I think that's what's really cool about coming to the cons, especially internationally, is that we were able to see posters that we wouldn't normally see, or photos in the States. Oh, oh the, the best major teaser. No, I was just saying, uh, I see great t-shirts stateside in America at the cons and at film festivals, but they're they're I, they're kind of the same sometimes. But almost every t-shirt I've seen here, I've never seen before. It's been it's really fun. And I saw toy. I saw one a fuck say, a one a suck face t-shirt, which I've never seen before. Really, that's really uh, cool. That's really yeah. Cool. Have, how about um, have you seen any any stuff that you want here? Have you seen any cool stuff? I saw a French poster of Nightmare 2 with you on it. Yeah, it's amazing. And, um, yeah, I bet, uh, yeah, it was beautiful. And it was an original poster. Can we talk about the origin of the picture there, you, the, from the publicity shot they're using for you? Oh, okay, my, that, that's an old headshot of me when I was 20 years old. I look very... I'm, I've got that stare. I look like I'm 11. Yeah. And, it should have been and, in a like movie. Like mad or, or something. Yeah. <laughs> and I have a, a tie on, so I don't know where that came from, but it's cool. That's a good one. That's a good one. All right. I'm going to give the audience a chance uh, to ask a question. So guys, if you have a question, hands up. And Bastian would come in the, with a microphone. Where is he? The microphone's over there. He's waving at a yellow one. Oh. All right. Uh, hello. I got a question for Robert England. Uh, you're quite close with Doc Bradley, but who would win, Freddy or Pinhead? <laughs> oh, Ooh. listen. I kicked that pinhead's ass. <laughs> and then after pinhead, I kicked that little Chucky down the street. Yeah. I'm ready to rumble! <laughs> no, you know, Doug Bradley, Doug Bradley and I did a movie together. We were like six weeks in a beautiful coastal city in Spain with Jonathan Reese Myers, the beautiful Melinda Clark, and uh, half the cast from Michael Ritchie's film Snatch. Uh, and we had a little town plaza in Spain all to ourselves. And you could wake up and open the shutters of your hotel room and you'd look down and you'd see the umbrellas and the picnic tables in the square. And it was all our crew and our cast every day we'd kind of taken over this little uh, town square, two or three hundred years old. And Doug Bradley, Pinhead, could drink everybody under the table. In America, we have an expression called a hollow leg. He has a hollow leg. That guy, he just measures himself perfectly. I don't know if you guys know it, but Pinhead, Doug Bradley, when he went to boarding school in England, his roommate was Clive Barker. That's true, if you have a And thank you for the question. Next one, please. This is a question for uh, Mr. England. Uh, quite recently you did a Halloween episode for the Goldbergs, uh, coming back as Freddy. Uh, what made you decide to come back in the makeup uh, for that particular episode? Well, my agent, uh, <laughs> my agent would have probably fired me if I didn't do it. The, uh, it's his favorite show, it's his family's favorite show. And uh, his kids love it, and his kids aren't allowed to see Freddy. And, uh, Freddie helped pay for the house they live in. So he, this was their way, it was sort of that, you know, uh, this is an Eli Roth quote, but, because uh, he was saying this about the, the house with a clock on the walls. But I, I think my Goldberg ex episode is sort of what we call gateway horror. You've heard of gateway drugs, ooh, marijuana, ooh, it's a gateway drug. Well, I think my Goldberg's episode is a gateway horror. There were a lot of kids. It 
was fun to do because I got to work with Wendy and Clendon Covey. And I've been a friend of hers since Little Tilden Brides Nails. And it me a beautiful, true page that ever. Now, that's actually uh, what happened to Goldberg's uh, uh, the big creator of the Nightmare Trip. And he was a story to watch a friend from Elm Street, watch the snuck neck parent with his girl, and then, and wish mother with her hippie. Oh, oh you went out of his juniors, I have said. Solution, no, no, a hot bad night be fine. Just this, so he's gonna take a hot bath, you'll, and he had a that Fred took a clock in the bath, his legs, and got a night of garage. My favorite victim? Well, I'm sitting with all of them right now. I can have the taste of blood in my mouth. Uh, you know, I, um, I really think the scariest sequence is Amanda Wiss as Tina being dragged across the ceiling of our phenomenal rotating set in Nightmare One. It's very disorienting. They're disorienting not only for the actors, but also for the audience to watch that sequence. Uh, I like I like killing Carlos in uh, Freddy's Dead Part Six. You know, get that little special needs boy and pump up the volume. Nice. Uh, can we get another question? Not for me. <laughs> I have got to ask the cast. <laughs> Is it okay to ask Robert again? <laughs> <laughs> Robert, first. I'm not kidding, punk. <laughs> Thank you very much for all your movies. Uh, you're welcome. You were like Santa Claus to me and my youth. <laughs> Only Santa Claus brought me presents and you gave me nightmares. Thanks for that. Krampus. Uh, as a fan, of course, as you can see, I'm a little fan of you. The whole franchise, of course, uh, is a one more Freddy movie in you. No, no. Um, they're rebooting the franchise. It's a different company. New Line Cinema was sold to Time Warner. Time Warner asked Michael Bay, the man that brought you Transformers, he has a company called Platinum Dunes. And that company and people involved in that company are responsible for rebooting the New Line uh, library, which includes Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Friday the 13th, as well as Nightmare on Elm Street. They want to reboot the franchise. I can't possibly do another seven or eight movies. I would be loved to be invited back to do a remake of Part 3. You know, maybe play one of the doctors. Uh, you know, a skeptical doctor who doesn't believe in the collective nightmare. <laughs> that might be fun. Thank but I, I, my, the only way they could get me back is if they'd let me kill Danny Hassel again. Ooh. <laughs> could you say that they're putting the boo in reboot? <laughs> Thank you for the question. Have you been hanging Cody Field? <laughs> yes, can we? Hi, Paul. Uh, in the new Hatton, I made a little go through the Halloween, huh? Then everything makes sequel after the original existed and Redcon storyline in the cave and that. It's no more there. The existing and nothing existed. If they there's a similar thing. The answer question is, they did a start and we did with the belief to French never attempted to what they do you deserve a sequel? Alright. Anyone? Is it the way they should start? So you're saying, uh, which shoot if it's where you are the, uh, the reboot? Well, certainly, I die. <laughs> uh, well, I went before I play. <laughs> I want to see who's Rick's role. Who would, would be a good reboot for prize? What do you think? Oh, okay. Fantastic. New role. I think they should be in four. They're cohesive. I, th I think I think three are cohesive together. I think that makes sense. Like four kind of go in each other. They're, they're all good on their own. I'm just saying that we do four are cohesive. I think if when I look back with hindsight on the entire franchise, there's some things that need to be fixed in part two. There's some great stuff thematically in part two, and there's some great sweet, there's some great scenes in part two. But they take Freddy out of the green, which is a cardinal, it's a, it's a violation of a cardinal rule 
from the Bible of Wes Craven that Freddy's always in the dream. Freddy's dead. He only exists in the imagination of a potential victim who's somehow related to someone uh, uh, that, that had to do with the death of Freddy, a vigilante parent, the children of a vigilante parent, a relative. So he only, when you hear of Freddy around a campfire at summer camp, or when you talk about Freddy in the locker room, uh, or at a sleepover uh, with your friends, once you've heard the myth of Freddy, the legend, you become infected because you can imagine Freddy, and once you can imagine Freddy, he can take hold of your subconscious and come after you. But he's not hanging out in the alley having a cigarette. You know, he's, that's not, he's not reality bound. He's not earth bound. He exists in, in this sort of ephemeral the consciousness of the potential victims. Nice. Thank you for the answer. Thank you for the questions, guys. Any ideas? And where we should do the reboot from which, uh, which part to start? Joanne, Toy? I think from three. Yeah, I think it's good. No, I agree. I think three hits it for me. I, I love the whole concept of if these kids are in a mental institution because they're believing in something that no one else will believe they actually know is true. And I think from there is such a great jumping off point. Um, it's one of my favorites as well. Um, but I think also those characters were really well defined. Um, and I think from there we can actually explore not just those characters but so many others moving forward. Build on. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Uh, uh, we have to make one more uh, nope. for one more question. Nope. So please get good. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. Yeah. This is what you asked. Uh, hello, take us back. Please. For the whole cast, how what can you to be in the 2 8 and tell us at the time? I would like that for you, especially uh, how came about for this beautiful song. Stay. Uh, how? Yes. Uh, well, um, that song came about was um, I just had heard that they were going to do some music for the film, so I uh, I just asked Randy Harlan, the director, if I could you know present something to him, and uh, he said sure, why not you know, um, and I went off and I went with my writing partner at the time, and uh, we just took one day in the studio and just wrote it out and uh, recorded it in like four hours. And um, they ended up using, actually using the recording that we did. And I came back and I, I uh, had it in my car and I opened up the doors and I played it for Rennie and he just, he really flipped over it. He really liked it and uh, so that's how it came about. I did not know it was going to be the title song though. I knew it was going to be in the film, but when I saw it come on I was, I was pretty much in shock and uh, really happy about that. Yeah, that must have been really excited. It was. Exciting. It was exciting. It really was. It's yeah. really cool. It's a, and the rest is history. Yeah. It's really cool. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so guys, how was it in, <clears throat> sorry, how was it the, being in the, what was the question? How was being in the 80s? And how was being the part of the franchise that is so popular in the 80s? Uh, well, we'll just go down, down the line. Uh, well, uh, I mean, the reason I'm in Nightmare we, in, on Elm Street, we all auditioned, I don't know, many, many times, many callbacks. But the reason I'm actually in the film was because Tuesday was in those sessions and she was the one who was sort of whispering in Rennie's ear saying, oh, you should pick that guy. And uh, I don't know why she did that, but it worked out well for me. And so it's uh, so you know, and then we ended up going out for a couple of years. So it was a, it was good all around. It was good all around. <laughs> Taking me back to the '80s, just with your question. Thank you. I will say um, when I watched Nightmare on Elm Street Four, it reminds me of the the heightened awareness of MTV culture. And when I watched the movie, it reminds me of a long version of a music video, um, and it. That class pace, Nispo, and the clothes, and especially my character was really were um, drum and mod. It was like that's where girl he took it, you know. So potentially black mosh pit was at some good concert. Me and um, it's me. I punk punk juxtaposition it and so for, and love the for, yeah to know the eighties um, just nightmare for it brings back it's just a true eighties. Number two is really, I think number three and four are the, the biggest, three grossing, the most successful out of the, the franchise. And 
I was, in, I was at a party in San Francisco before the movie came out, all these really cool hipster people, and no one was giving me any attention. <laughs> and the trailer from the movie came on, and the whole party that was so cool stopped and watched it. And I knew it. at that moment, I go, oh my god, we're going to be... And then, I still didn't know how successful, but then when the actual movie came out, we all got together, we actually went to the cinema to watch it, the line was around the corner. It was like all you guys were there. So it was it was a great moment. So it was a, it was a lot of fun being in a successful movie. Nice. Nice to see you guys. Come by my table, we'll talk about anything. Yeah. <laughs> um, so for me, I had auditioned for The First Nightmare. And um, then it came out. And then, so I didn't, uh, I was, I actually am in the movie because of Robert. Robert came to see a play that I was in with a, an actress named Lynn Shea, who was Robert Shea's sister. And it was called Starring in the Insidious franchise. Yeah, she's fantastic. And and she and I played dead people. She was a dead older woman and I was I was a dead teenage girl. And afterwards Robert had mentioned to Robert Shea that I might be good as one of the cheerleaders in Nightmare Two two that they were shooting. And um, so Robert Shea asked me what I was doing this week. And I never got a script and I um, was told to park my car on the side of a freeway and I got into a van. And, um, <laughs> and hope for the best. And I drove out and did the, you know, did the, the scene in the bus. And um, I thought Mark Patton was an extra because he was very quiet and he never didn't say anything. <laughs> so when I went to see the movie, I thought, well, that extra has a really good role. <laughs> I, I've been looking this way at our host, and I was looking over her shoulder. I couldn't help but notice the screen that's competing with everything we say. But I just saw the, the trailer for American Horror Story, and of course, another veteran of all the Nightmare movies, or at least parts one, three, and seven, Heather Langenkamp. She does the effects with her husband on that movie, and the special effect, the special makeup effects, which is kind of interesting to see that. And Joanne did uh, Joanne did a show with Heather, you know. That it, so that continued that relationship, as did the Rook. Yeah, so it's kind of, that's kind of all. The thing about the 80s that so, I remember, it was just a moment of time before over the, the idea of status. Sort of, we'd go to American art culture, New York, and you go to a Hollywood reading or a New York party or a fan, and there would kind of be a fan star on the, there'd be a, on one side was real rocks and to the other side a club, somebody be imagined with from it would be seen. It was a dressing mix, fashion, weren't there, there, they had a role, a great watch, people were Mercedes, because they, they were there, as long as they were into or it was bad, so, there being accessible, Hollywood was still accessible, you could still see great sounds up to use, and sneak into the screenings of movies and stuff, uh, and, and I believe that part of that was that the, the you know, I think you said the toy, the MTV generation, kind of stimulated people all over the world in fashion and music and sort of uh, roots bands and things. So it was a great, it was a great time to be young. Uh, and it was the last time, it was about the last time you could be poor, you know, and still have a, you know, and live well in, in LA or New York. Thank you so much. It's a great honor to have you all guys on stage and thank you very much to be here with us. And guys around